All right, we can get started and I'll just let people in as they show up in the lobby. Uh, but hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to our Cafe Scientific event uh, on the latest evidence on how to prevent falls. We have three experts today who are going to be talking to us about um, what the current uh, research says about falls and how we can use that to prevent the risk of falls. Um, a Cafe Scientific event is made to kind of bridge the gap between scientists and general public so that we can make science more approachable and more understandable so that people can actually use the findings in their day-to-day -day life. So for the first uh, presenter, we have uh, Dr. Richard Louis, who is a injury prevention specialist with Trauma New Brunswick. So he's going to give the first presentation and then we'll have Dr. Grant Handrigan from the University of Moncton uh, give us his presentation and then we'll have Dr. Danielle Bouchard uh, from the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton uh, finish up with her presentation. Each one will be about 15 minutes and then we'll give five minutes after each individual presentation if anybody has any questions that they want to ask that they don't want to forget. Um, you can either type it in the chat there's a question and answer box, or you can raise your hand and I can moderate and call on you if you have any questions. And then at the end of the session, we're going to have 20 minutes uh, for more questions and a discussion around how to prevent falls. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, but with that, I think we can start up with our first pre presenter. And I just want to remind you all that uh, after this presentation, we'll be sending you a survey so that we can get your feedback on this presentation and this event so that we can make it better for the future. So Richard, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen. All right, so that's what I'll do. You can do these. Perfect. All right, so again, big thank you for allowing me to, to speak to this group. So essentially today we're going to be talking about enhancing fall prevention efforts in New Brunswick and essentially what uh, myself as injury prevention specialist with the Tra New Brunswick uh, Trauma New Brunswick program, what we've been doing uh, in order to help out over the past few uh, years. So essentially, when we're talking about injury prevention, a lot of people might be thinking automatically about you know motor vehicle related injuries, uh, ATV related injuries, or sports related injuries. But really, when we look at the data, we're getting the recognition of the need to do more around false prevention in older adults. Knowing fully well that there's an unavoidable financial cost to injury, uh, I've uh, been working with my counterparts across Atlantic Canada in order to give us a sense of the scope and scale of the issue. So as you can see, uh, the leading causes of injuries here in New Brunswick, looking at the different age groups, looking at 0 to 14, the leading cause of injury is falls. 15 to 24, it's transport-related incidents because obviously that's when uh, kids start uh, driving and experimenting with uh, alcohol. So that's when we tend to see our larger numbers. 25 to 64, falls. 65 and over falls by far. So that's why, uh, you know, there's that recognition of the need to do more around falls prevention. And falls account for about 80% of uh, all injury costs for older adults. So in order to address it, there's a recognition of the need to have sufficient resources in order to have sustainable solutions. Having uh, great programs that are operating for a year or two uh, is not something that we uh, like to see. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. So looking at a uh, brief hospitalization data, it, it just it gave us a clearer sense. The green line here that you're looking at, these are falls in our children, uh, 14 and under. The blue line being falls in older adults, 65 and older, and the red line being falls in all age groups. What you can clearly see, number one, there's a trend where it's it's climbing, uh, so uh, the numbers aren't going down. And you can also see spikes, uh, predictable spikes that occur uh, regularly during the winter months, more specifically between January and uh, March. If we're looking even further along, 
uh, we can see that there's going to be a predictable increase in the number of uh, fall cases that are being hospitalized across uh, the province in hospitals across the province. Where 2010, we had about 2,000 cases, 2020, 2,800. What we're expecting to see uh, by 2030, uh, about 4,130 cases. And by 2040, that's what we uh, expect to see. So using the same uh, language that was used uh, during the COVID epidemic, uh, the goal here is to try to flatten this curve uh, in order to be sure that we have uh, sufficient resources in order to address uh, this concern. Might be asking, why do we tend to see this uh, trend? One reason is uh, the ease at which older adults feel comfortable admitting that they've had a fall in the past 12 months, where research shows that in the states shows that about 31% of older adults, females, uh, admitted that they've had a fall. And when we're looking at older men, it's even worse. So without in having that interaction with your primary care provider, it's very difficult for them to start the process of doing a proper fall risk screening and multifactorial fall risk assessment. So without initiating that conversation, uh, the interventions in order to reduce the risk of falls aren't uh, done. So what did we do? Essentially, uh, it all started for myself uh, really seriously during the COVID epidemic that provided me with some time to create our fall pre provincial uh, fall prevention strategic plan. Uh, got accepted in September 2020, essentially outlined the uh, spheres of activity, essentially providing effective patient navigation, supporting home safety assessment interventions, supporting exercise-based fall prevention programs, enhancing fall risk screening, and last but not least, providing support to our primary care providers who are so overwhelmed and really needing that level of support. So for that, uh, provided, uh, developed some useful tools looking at best practice for fall risk reading and multifactorial fall risk assessment through collaborative effort with my counterparts in BC and Ontario to develop a consensus statement that would go along with the algorithm. However, uh, by December 2022, the World Guidelines for False Prevention and Management for Older Adults was released, which really necessitated uh, for me to take, again, a few steps back in order to revise these documents before making it uh, readily available for our healthcare professionals. And I'll, uh, for that, was lucky enough to be able to uh, collaborate with Horizon and more specifically Collaborative Care Senior Health in order to do a fall prevention practice survey in order to get some feedback from uh, primary care providers and themselves. So that survey had a pretty good response rate, 33%. Uh, again, with healthcare professionals, we can't expect uh, too much, but really that was a good response rate for uh, primary care providers. With that, we've uh, got the information that about 16% used uh, a fall prevention screening or assessment tool, and 76% were interested in using a standardized fall risk screening and assessment tool. So right there, you can see the gap. And beyond that, 32% felt like they didn't have adequate support that they could provide to uh, their patients. 5% only reported that they provided specific handouts on how to pre prevent falls. So again, uh, you know, not a lot. But 71%, very interesting, uh, really looked for a simple care pathway in order to manage, uh, screen and manage uh, falls in their practice. So with that, all of that information really confirmed the need for me to go uh, and per continue with efforts to simplify uh, those resources and make it readily available for our healthcare providers so that their practice is uh, that much more uh, simple. So here's the revised algorithm that really uh, simplified this whole process. 
Uh, and with that, we've uh, been able to reduce uh, the number of recommended interventions for patients at high risk. Before we had about uh, listed about 20 interventions. Now we're down to uh, nine or 10. And obviously ongoing collaboration, like I, I mentioned earlier with collaborative care senior health in order to be sure that uh, the resources that we're providing is of the best quality possible. And beyond that, also developing e-learning modules so that uh, healthcare professionals know how to best use these available uh, clinical tools. So here, just to go real quick with regards to uh, fall risk screening, and just to give an example of one of the tools that we're making readily available. So when we're talking about fall risk screening, it starts with opportunistic screening with either three key questions or using the staying independent checklist. Uh, the staying independent checklist is a simple checklist that could be filled in before going to see uh, your primary care provider that we encourage older adults to use. Uh, so whether it's at, at, in the waiting room or at home, this simple 12 questions could be filled in and, uh, in order to help that conversation about their personal fall risk factor. Beyond that, uh, you continue with fall severity screening and mobility screening. And here too, we uh, create a simple tool for healthcare providers in order to remind them on how to do proper time up and go for stage bound test and other type of uh, tests that should be done in order to assess mobility. Beyond that, simple checklist that could be used in order to uh, note the results from the opportunistic screening, fall severity screening, and mobility screening. But beyond that, on the flip side, information about how, uh, what steps to do for a patient at low risk, at intermediate risk, and at high risk. Again, uh, all of this information was made within, uh, put into a false prevention toolkit, which includes those resources and additional resources uh, that I mentioned and additional resources in order to help uh, primary care providers. But beyond that, like I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, just before going to the next slide, just to mention that all resources available in both official languages, but like I mentioned earlier, there's also the e-learning module that is currently in construction that I hope to uh, be able to release in the uh, next few months. Beyond that, we also have an awareness campaign that we uh, launch every uh, November, which is recognized uh, across Canada as False Prevention Month. So during the month of November, we encourage people to talk to each other, to break the ice, to make it less uh, onerous to talk about false prevention. And like we say, this fall, let's all talk falls. It's really to encourage that intergenerational approach to false prevention. For that, we also have, like you can see, uh, the landing page. You can have access to information uh, at falltalk.ca. But we also have a central repository of fall prevention resources uh, at our Finding Balance website. So for Finding Balance New Brunswick, Right now, we're working on updating the website, but you can still find some really good information, really great resources uh, by going to findingbalancenb.ca. There you'll find resources like a home safety checklist, a fall prevention toolkit for uh, older adults, uh, information about a virtual trek around New Brunswick, so an activity journal that we encourage older adults to use during the month of November to note how much physical activity they did during the month. Uh, safe winter walking brochures. And like I mentioned, with regards to an intergenerational approach to false prevention, uh, stickers, bookmarks, posters around the importance of walking like a penguin. It's really cute. Uh, having the kids walking like a penguin and having that conversation with their grandparents about the importance of being uh, safe uh, during the winter and across the, the year uh, with regards to false prevention. 
last but not least, also want to talk about uh, su providing support to exercise based false prevention programs like Zoomers on the Go that you'll uh, get a chance to learn more about. But really uh, to know that the best intervention to reduce your risk of uh, injury or uh, fall related injury is to get physically active, but not any type of physical activity, those type of physical activities that challenge your balance. So uh, we know that exercise-based fall prevention programs are the best intervention, most effective intervention to prevent falls. And more specifically, uh, exercise-based fall prevention program include an educational component to it. So it's not just challenging your balance, it's learning about ways to reduce your risk for falls. So right now there's a research underway to assess the effectiveness of uh, such programs with uh, higher risk groups. So essentially, just want to mention that, yes, there's activity happening at uh, Trauma NB in order to support efforts currently underway, because uh, what we uh, really uh, take to heart is that most injuries are preventable and that we can all play a role in order to reduce that. So whether you're a healthcare professional, a caregiver, a loved one, we can all play a role. So with that, just want to say a big thanks for allowing me to, 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 uh, to talk to you today. And if ever you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Here's my email address, and it'd be my pleasure to answer any questions you might have if you don't think about them uh, today. And with that, open to questions. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. That was a great presentation. Do we have any questions from anybody in the audience about this first presentation? Not seeing any hands up, but you can also just feel free to turn your microphone off and ask. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, I can start us off, though. Um, so, Richard, that's great. All of those uh, resources that you have available to not just healthcare providers, but people who kind of want to take the action themselves to assess their fall risk using those tools. They look really simple and easy to use. Mm. What kind of people do you think should use those resources? I guess that's the question. How, who do you think should use those resources? Is there a certain type of person or is it? Well, essentially, no. It's it's obviously older adults themselves, right? It's great resources for you to, to use, but just a concerned individual, right? It could be for yourself. It could be for a loved one, for a friend, you know, it could be for, you know, for anyone, right? For a, multiple purposes. So really it's what, the value you take from each one of those resources that I mentioned a little bit earlier. And just to give you a quick sense, uh, what I can do is I'll share my screen just to give uh, those uh, that are in attendance just a quick look at what the fall prevention toolkit for older adults, what it includes. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but just to give you a little sneak peek at what it looks like. So the cover page, uh, essentially, like you can see, encouraging that interaction with your primary care provider. And like I mentioned earlier, collaborating with Horizon in order to uh, get the final version of this uh, resource. So with this, there's a table of contents and the first one page, the first uh, piece of information that's understanding your risk for falls. And again, just a little bit of information about assessing your risk for falls, fall risk factors, and the importance of consulting your primary care provider. Beyond that, the staying independent checklist, like I mentioned earlier, the 12 questions that you can fill in before going to see your primary care provider in order to uh, have that conversation about each individual fall risk factor that you may or may not have. Beyond that, information about foot, the importance of footwear and foot care, the proper shoe, uh, information about medication safety, information about staying physically active uh, before getting active, helpful tips, uh, moving, moving safely at home, 
you know, uh, knowing that you have support from family and friends, if not occupational therapists, physiotherapists, and other uh, sources of information that you might get for support. Uh, and if what to do if someone falls again, whether it's for yourself or for a friend or a loved one, knowing what to do, the steps to 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 go through uh, to get back up in order to uh, get that additional support if needed. And at the end, a little personal action plan that you can uh, fill in for each uh, fall risk factor in order to take steps in order to medicate them. So really a simple tool that can be used by anyone, whether it's for yourself or for someone. That's great. And that fall prevention toolkit is available right on the website? Uh, you can go to the landing page, falltalk.ca, and have access to those resources. And you will even see a few resources for a healthcare professional. That's awesome. Thank you very much. I see Hi. Lynn BT. Sorry, it's Helen Lovesack. I have a question for Richard that I've never seen answered anywhere. Um, and that is I've had a couple of falls. Both of them were because I turned my head in one direction and I could feel myself falling, not having tripped or over anything or whatever. But the first time I did it, I, I broke my wrist. And it's very hard to get up when you can't use one of your hands. Fortunately, there was a railing near, nearby so I could crawl over to it and then grab the railing to get myself up. But I've never seen that addressed anywhere. Like, what do you do when you're falling? You're falling on the street, nobody's around. And, and uh, you know, how do you handle a situation like that other than waiting for a passerby? Hmm. That's a very good question. So I, I, I no wish I had a, a better answer to give you, but, you know, uh, emer emergency response is difficult to obtain if you don't have a cell phone or a way to contact emergency services, especially if you're outdoors, right? I, uh, I, now have, I now have a device, but the one time I actually fell and the second time I fell, I was unconscious before I hit the ground mm -hmm. and I broke my cheekbone. And I was wearing a device with a GPS, and I was on a very busy street, fortunately, and several, a nurse, a bystander, a police officer, and the ambulance were there within minutes. Okay, so I was very fortunate. It was a busy intersection. But the thing didn't even work. I, I it didn't work. That was still. going to be my question. Did, was yeah. it useful, that device? Because often, no. again, no. I... It was underneath my winter coat, and mm -hmm. apparently it should have been outside of the coat. All right, so they, but the instructions from TELUS were to wear it inside a shirt. So mm -hmm. there's a, some mix up there. Anyway, that was just my situation. But that's a great point to bring up and really, you know, to try to find solutions. Uh, the first step is to discuss about the, the, the issue. So uh, honestly, I, 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 I didn't, uh, I haven't made efforts to address that specific issue, but I can let you know from uh, today on, it's on my radar. Uh, I, and especially knowing that those devices aren't foolproof. I mean, it, it does happen that falls occur without them notifying, the device notifying the proper people. So to maybe follow up with uh, Ambulance New Brunswick, uh, would be my next step. I think that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Okay. I did post uh, in the chat like some resources for like learning how to get back on your feet once you yeah. fall. And but if there's... you're unconscious or if yeah. you're, yeah. you need that support, that that piece of information isn't really useful. So thank you so very much for that information. Uh, a question to uh, Richard saying like, uh, are the pamphlets distributed um, at the extramural offices and doctor's office to give out to clients? Yeah, so uh, those, those that information is being made readily available through a partnership with the New Brunswick Medical Society. So primary care providers can have uh, access to all of those uh, printed out. Obviously, they need to print it out themselves uh, in order to make it readily available in their clinic. Uh, however, when we're talking about partnership with Ambulance New Brunswick, that's where uh, more would need to be done. I say Ambulance New Brunswick, it's Medavi. Uh, 
uh, in order to do, be a good partner with ambulance and extramural program so that those resources could be made readily available if ever you have that interaction with them. So uh, those are ongoing conversations that are happening. Uh, obviously, my primary focus is with primary care providers, but knowing fully well that there's healthcare professionals with Medavi, with long-term care facilities, with uh, Patient Connect New Brunswick, and other uh, pockets of activities that would need to be on the same page. So those are activities that are uh, being planned for uh, for this fiscal year. I do have one more comment about uh, MacGyvering getting up from a fall. There's a really interesting video I found on YouTube once about how to use your furniture and whatever to manage to get up, you know, using it as a seat or stepping up to a couch or whatever. So, but you have to remember to how to do the things that you saw months or years ago. And sometimes that doesn't happen in an emergency. You can't think of all of these things. Yeah. So would you think like a poster or something would be more usable uh, or what would you recommend? Uh, well, for, they were recommending furniture, like turning turning a side table upside down and using the or using the arms to kind of leave yourself up on a cushion. Then from the cushion, leave yourself up backwards to the couch. Um, like whatever it is you have ha around. I was fortunate when I broke my wrist that there was a railing. I was in front of a restaurant, and there was a railing beside the sidewalk in the road, and I was able to go on my knees and hobble over and grab the railing to get myself up with one arm. Um, and uh, then I was able, you know, then I was fine. And then somebody finally noticed in the restaurant and brought me a chair to sit on and a passerby used her cell phone to call for an ambulance. So, but if you're in an, you know, in an area where you're, there's not a lot of, not many passerbys or whatever, you could be waiting for quite a while, especially if you're unconscious, you know. Yeah. Uh, All right. Okay, we have one more hand up that we can get to quickly before we move over to uh, Grant's presentation. Uh, I think Diane, is that? Yes, um, I find this very interesting, so I appreciate having this session, uh, having gone through a lot with my mother, who's now in a nursing home. But I, I have some questions, observations. Um, one of them, I, I am curious, where, like, which injuries happen the most? Is it the hip bone? Is it knees? Like, that. that's one of my uh, curiosities that I'd be interested in knowing. Um, yeah, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, well, there's different levels of uh, injury, right? Going from the bumps and bruises that you typically don't even see, they don't even get to the emergency department, where you might have patients uh, just calling emergency services for a lift the Cisco, right? Uh, so those occur like just that uh, image of our iceberg and what's happening beneath the water. Those are injuries that occur every day that we have no data on, right? Then we have those injuries that occur that are only seen in emergency departments. Those that would need just a sling, a, a sprained wrist, mm -hmm. uh, 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 again, a bump, a bruise, a bit more significant. Uh, but those are the type of injuries that we'd see. But the more significant ones are either traumatic brain injuries. So again, you might not necessarily need to hit your head but you might have that impact force traveling up, which would rattle uh, your, your brain within your skull. That would necessitate the differential between a chronic brain bleed or even a concussion. So brain injury. Number two, it's your fractures. Whether you're breaking a, a arm, uh, trying to reduce the impact force, or a broken hip where you just land on your unfortunate, and then you have to be on the waiting list and having to wait for surgeries. So for myself, I typically look at hospitalization data uh, in order to get a better sense of the more significant type of injuries in order to address them, things like the traumatic brain injuries and your fractures. Okay, thank you, interesting. Um, 
just other observations was primary care uh, provider. It's a known problem in New Brunswick that not everyone has one. So I'm wondering if um, people who are more at risk are put higher up on the priority of having a primary care physician or where do they go? What do they do? Well, th that's conversations, the um, um, ongoing conversations uh, having with uh, Patient Connect uh, in order to see how they manage the waiting list and how they attribute a primary care providers to those that are on the waiting list. Uh, but today I didn't even mention some of the research projects that Trauma NB is involved with. One of them is a fall prevention clinic in order to further provide support to our primary care provider. So instead of going to see a primary care provider, you could go uh, to your fall prevention clinic in order to have a comprehensive fall risk assessment and your personal care plan. Uh, right now it's in the pilot phase and we hope to get more information in the next couple of months in order to evaluate and then see if we can expand it to a couple of additional community health center. So it's a community health center based uh, approach to false prevention care. That's good, yes. Um, also, uh, just the, the last uh, lady who had comments or questions, um, it made me think of the alert system having either something around your neck or around your wrist. I think I just want to mention it's very important to put that in place early um, with my mother's situation by the time like she she started having dementia and um, which turned into Alzheimer's. So if we put if we try to put that system when it's later on, it's not going to work. So I think that's yeah. a really good system. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Yeah. All good comments. Thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, thank you, Richard, for your presentation and answering those questions. Um, if anybody else has any other questions for Richard, uh, you can either write them down or write them in the chat and I can read them out afterwards and we can discuss them if you don't want to forget them. Um, but with that, we're going to switch over to uh, Dr. Grant Handrigan's presentation. So Grant, you can share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, just a comment there. Um, I really appreciate uh, all the interaction, all the questions. It's fascinating. I'm taking notes and it's given me a lot to think about. And uh, Richard, also, thank you for presenting, uh, you know, a very detailed presentation in a short amount of time. There's a lot of information there, a lot of statistics, uh, things that uh, I'd like to follow up on after with you if I get a, get a chance to do that. Uh, so I'll share my screen. I've got a presentation of about, I don't know, maybe 12 to 15 minutes. Um, share some of the um, activities that I've been working on in the last little while and also um, a few insights, I guess, and things that I'm I'm thinking about. So uh, just to confirm that you can see my screen, are we good? Yes, you're good. OK, perfect. Um, so the title of the presentation is uh, Balancing Act, Science and Strategies Preventing Falls in Everyday Life. Um, my name is Grant. I'm a pro uh, professor at the University of Moncton in Moncton. My background is in kinesiology, so um, science of uh, exercise sciences, basically. So I, I approach fall prevention from a, a biological, like a physical point of view. But as uh, Richard said, it's not just limited to like the physical side of things. There's a lot of different things that can be done. So interests are kind of expanding with that uh, as I kind of keep, you know, following this this line of questioning. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is that falls, uh, it's, as Richard mentioned again, he's a hard act to follow with all that information. I was updating my presentation, deleting stuff as I was going through it because I can't can't repeat after that. But uh, I think he, Richard presented some good data on, on falls or something that it's a huge issue for our society and uh, affects everybody, uh, children, you know, adults, older adults. Uh, the, the goal I think today is to focus in on older adults who are disproportionately affected by falls, but it's not just an issue for older adults. And I don't think any solution that's going to have any that's going to get any traction, uh, it, it it needs to focus larger than just targeting, you know, 
helping older adults. But I think it's a community based. It's a definitely an entire family sort of approach uh, that we need to take when we're considering it. Uh, so an outline of the presentation is um, introductions uh, and then a few thoughts on the value of contributing to research. Uh, Danielle is going to present after and I think she's going to continue on that discussion, but it's a it's an in interesting uh, topic that I've had some experience with in the last little while working with uh, uh, a program. Uh, we're going to look at a, how big of a challenge our falls. Uh, how do we maintain our balance? So what types of of activities and systems in the body do we need uh, that are functioning, that are properly functioning to maintain our balance? What can be done to prevent a fall? And are there any programs that help uh, improve balance and mobility? And where can you get more information? So Richard really covered that in detail as well. Uh, so first, as part of the introduction, uh, I, you know, thrown out the question, what is aging? I think uh, when I was starting uh, this kind of work, I had a pretty clear definition of what aging was, and I, I'm not ashamed to admit that it was way too narrow and uh, simplified sort of version. And um, I'm growing uh, my understanding of it. And I think that some of the stuff in the field uh, and research today is 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 actually expanding on it as well. So it's like our definition of what aging is, what's considered normal aging is changing. Uh, there's some things uh, that over the last number of years that have kind of shifted the way we think about aging, um, particularly around how we can improve our quality of life, but not necessarily expand the lifespan. So it's mostly about adding quality to the years that we have and exercise is a very uh, strong um, tool that can help people uh, add quality of life uh, doesn't necessarily expand lifespan unless it's you know going to prevent some sort of traumatic injury or other. Then after uh, originally in the aging and like the health healthy aging research, there was a focus to observe people who successfully age. So you know what are these people doing that led them to be able to live until you know into their 90s and be mobile and independent and contribute to society. So there was a, a bit of a shift uh, from trying to understand what these people d were doing to realizing that a lot of it is around the behaviors, the the activities that they're doing. So the understanding went from successful aging to, hey, this is something that we can modify if we adopt certain types of behaviors. And uh, my interests are mostly around including exercise in that and how exercise is something that takes from us. Obviously, there's effort into it, there's organization, there's thought, that sort of thing, but contributes a lot in exchange. So there's a, a pretty well accepted that, you know, you can participate in different types of activities now that's going to help uh, you adapt to the changes that are going to happen with aging that are a normal part of aging and make that transition a little smoother. Uh, and a few thoughts, uh, like random thoughts a bit on research. Um, goal of Café Scientifique is to kind of bridge maybe the gap that's too large between research and practice and, and just helping people understand, myself included, the value of doing research. Um, I think health research is it's it's poorly understood in terms of what it can contribute. I think part of it is based is on the fact that it's 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 you know associated with the scientific method. It's one of the it's the best method that we have for generating new information, but it's kind of a long process and it's a bit rigid as a structure. Um, and some these are quotes that I I've heard from people in the last uh, seven days, like the conversations that I've had. I've heard some people say that, you know, research is health. Like if you're doing health research, this stuff contributes to advancing our understanding of health. And I've also heard from individuals that are uh, clinicians that are helping people uh, that, you know, that sort of thing that you're talking about, that's a research thing. It's not a clinical practice. It's not something we do in, in clinic. And for me, that you know, can't be further from the truth. I think that this type of research on fall prevention is about informing clinical practice. So I think that there's a lot of work that we need to do about uh, 
demystifying what research is and what we kind of aim to do with that and helping people understand uh, some of the, the constraints, maybe and opportunities around it. And Cafe Scientific is about that. And I, I think Danielle's going to get into that a little bit more about that after. Um, and then the other is a quote I had from a, a, a participant in a project that I'm working on currently that, you know, a real interest in learning a little bit more about the research part of the program. Some people that participate in research programs aren't interested in it. They want like the program aspect, like the exercise. But uh, I had some good conversations this week about people asking questions about that side of it. So very optimistic for that and very interested because uh, I think one of the ways that we're going to help people uh, you know, improve this situation is by doing this type of research that uh, that's required. Uh, so Richard got into it about how big of a uh, challenge are falls for older adults. Uh, every day, eight, nine people in New Brunswick are admitted to the hospital. Uh, there's more that visit an emergency room. Um, and uh, it's a huge cost to our society financially. And uh, just in my own life recently, a member of my family is dealing with uh, this, so it's kind of come very uh, close to me, and uh, i just like to highlight the, the challenge it is for, like, a, as a provincial sort of strategy, but how it affects a person, and physically, how it can affect a person, but also um, cognitively, about confidence, about understanding, like, the limits of their own uh, sort of you know, behaviors, actions, and how it can change someone's outlook. So not to be lost in like the larger problem, but it's definitely, uh, you know, scope of, of a provincial, a population wide, but each individual, I think, uh, comes with specific risk factors, causative factors, and uh, will need different things addressed. And I think that's one of the things that makes falls prevention such a challenging thing is that there's for every person there's a different type of fall there's a different type of thing that leads them to falling so there's no real one solution that works for everybody and i think that that understanding is important because getting our way out of this sort of situation is not going to be just with one approach it's going to be like multiple approaches so some of the work that i did during my um, training like my education was understanding how people maintain their balance. So how do we maintain our balance? And I think this is important for understanding how and why people fall and why there's so many different things that can cause and fall in people. Uh, for example, people uh, like the stand, there's different structures and sensors and systems in your body that are responsible for it. So there's like the visual information that we use that we rely on for controlling our balance. There's um, sensors throughout our body, in our joints, in our muscles, uh, in the soles of our feet, like on the skin surface, that all these sensors provide different information. And we also have a vestibular system in our ear that provides information about our head orientation in uh, with gravity sort of thing, like if we're upright or not, and it responds to like rapid movements. So these types of sensors are like feeding information into our brain that are integrating the information. So if you know vision is an issue for you, then that's something that needs to be addressed because that's important information for for uh, balance control. Same with the, the the receptors that are throughout our body. And exercise is very powerful at activating and keeping them um, well functioning. So then all of these things, including like the muscular side, feed back into the brain. And sometimes it's like a it's a cognitive thing. So you can have good systems intact. You can have a good muscular system, but the issue is around a cognitive issue that's causing the fall. So with all of these different things interacting, uh, it it it's that people come at this with a uh, in an individual sort of thing. So being, uh, for example, assessed by a health professional is an important part of it, trying to understand where are the different areas that might need work because not everybody comes at it uh, with the same background and same challenges. So to summarize, it's uh, uh, a, like a sum, um, it, it's it's a multifactorial sort of uh, issue, and it's about uh, finding where is, are your strengths and where are your weaknesses and what needs to be changed. And sometimes exercise is the answer. It happens to be for a lot of people. 
Uh, other times it could be something as simple as changing the lighting in your home, uh, improving your, your glasses, uh, you know, getting updates on prescription medications, all these different factors that affect all these different systems in our body. What can you do to prevent a fall? Um, you can self-assess. There's two very powerful questions. Have you fallen in the past 12 months? And are you scared of falling? So if you do answer yes to these questions, that's an indicator that you know you, you should maybe take another step forward in, in, in the self-assessment. There's some really great algorithms and, and uh, fall screening materials. They've come a long way in the last couple of years. Like these materials did not exist five years ago. And they're, you know, with the work that Richard's doing, they're out there now, so it's really good. Of course, consult with a health professional. Challenges there if you have access to one. Uh, uh, Richard touched on the importance of doing exercises that focus on challenging balance. It's important to, to train what you need to, to work on and to do it in a safe manner. And I think most importantly, it's to take action. Like I, I heard it from a participant in a, pro in a project that I'm working on that become an advocate like they're an advocate for their own health so they've taken it on themselves to take responsibility for it and i think that's an important point as well there are programs to help people thankfully uh, one of the ones that i've been working on here locally is called boost your balance or boost a votre ballon it's a program that's funded by the healthy seniors pilot project uh, we currently have a couple of people working on this project uh, with dr jalila giblou and uh, dr mark signal uh, from University of Moncton and University of Toronto and uh, some students uh, helping with it. Right now, for example, there are two groups that meet twice a week for 90 minutes at the SEPs here at the University of Moncton in Moncton, and we have a total of 93 participants. And these people are meeting twice a week for 90 minutes and doing exercises that challenge their balance. There are lots of great resources out there. Uh, there's some shared in the chat. Uh, there's a great site, Fall Prevention Community Practice Loop, uh, there's the finding balance and then there's parachute which is more around um, statistics but there's also some good infographics so these resources uh, exist online uh, to help you know get more information because i think that that's uh that's the first step for for you know taking this forward so in conclusion um i just want to reiterate the importance of being open to sharing and participating in research projects because it's it can be kind of funny sometimes with some sort of constraints and, and ask you to do things that sometimes it's, it's difficult to understand why, but uh, just ask the question. And if the opportunity arises, I encourage you to, to contribute to research because that's, our, I think, our way out of this. Um, falls are a really important challenge on a provincial level, a population level, but they also affect an individual and each person differently, and that's important to understand. Maintaining our balance is simple when it works, when it's not working so well, it's complex and it's usually interaction between different systems and each one of these things has to be addressed independently. There are things that you can do to prevent a fall. Most important, I think, is to take action and recognize if you're at risk and to work on that. There are programs that exist, not enough programs. Access is not wide enough uh, and, and uh, available for enough people, but uh, you know there are good people working hard on getting these programs out there. And there are different resources that if you're interested uh, that I can help share and uh, bridge that kind of gap. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to any questions and um, Danielle's presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Grant. That was a great presentation. I think the big message there that there's a lot of different things that uh, impact the risk of falling and, you know, there's not it's not just one thing that can make it or break it if you're gonna fall or not. And that exercise is a big piece to that. Um, I definitely have some questions, but I can save those to the end just as we're a little behind. But does anybody else have any questions related to Grant's presentation? Oh, we have one in the chat. Are there link any links to senior balance exercise videos you can share? Uh, Danielle's got some resources I think that uh, she can share on that. Uh, I don't have to cite like the website in front of me and I know that she's doing some work on that as well, but there's definitely videos. Uh, Danielle, do you have that site? Yeah, yeah. she does. Yeah. I'll okay. share it now. Grant, actually, can you give us a little bit more information about the Boost Your Balance program? Is that just in Moncton? Where is it at and what does it look like? Yeah, it's a good question. It's just here in Moncton. It's a program that we've developed 
Uh, there's some specific questions that we're interested around. Part of it is incorporating technology. So like the people that we're talking about, the fall sensors, like the alert bracelets, these sorts of things, that's a, a, an interest of mine. I've, like I said, uh, initially it's just the exercise stuff that keeps me interested. But when you realize that there are other parts of it, it kind of takes you towards that. So like the, the program does deal with technology, but at its core, uh, it's a program that is focused on uh, specific balance exercises. So it's an exercise program. Some people think, you know, we're going to get you in and we're going to get you like jumping and sweating and this sort of stuff, but it's not that. It's more about challenging your balance, working on agility, reaction time, and uh, so exercise, but a different type of exercise. And that's what we do uh, twice a week here at the uh, university right now. We had four groups in the fall and we have two groups now. And we're moving towards the end of the funding and uh, the next goal is to get the information out about the program uh, to work on the results and uh, hopefully um, be able to continue to offer it going forward because uh, the feedback we've got from our participants has been tremendous so it's it's a it's a fall prevention Great. program that we kind of built here in-house based around exercise and technology we have someone who asked in the chat how does someone join the boost your balance program um email me <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm the point of contact for it so like my i can put my email address here in the chat and just send me email and um, go from there great there's, there's also a website to uh boost well, let's see so yeah, for everyone listening, we have like the Boost Your Balance program that Grant does at the University of Moncton in Moncton. And then another one you'll hear about is the Zoomers on the Go or uh, Zoomers in Balance program that Danielle will probably talk about in her next slide. Um, and we can have a bigger conversation at the end of the presentation about how those fit together, how they're similar, differences, that, that kind of stuff. Do we have any other questions for Grant before we move to yeah, it's Helen again. I, I ask a lot of questions because I'm a really nosy person and <clears throat> most of them are personal, but they may impact someone as well. I really, uh, re it really resonated when you said that um, there's, there's no one solution for everyone. And when I was doing my research after my falls, I couldn't find an answer to my specific situation. I'm not going to ask you because I don't think there is a specific answer. But uh, I know I have problems standing on one leg. And I wondered about the impact of orthotics. When you talked about feet, how we have sensors in the soles of our feet, uh, arthritis, et cetera, et cetera. Does that have a major impact since everything comes up from the feet does that really have a major impact and is there anything we can work on to rectify that problem with our feet it's a great question and that's kind of like the some of the work that i did for my phd was around uh, understanding how the receptors in the sole of our feet contribute towards maintaining balance and there's, you know, it's, it is, if you're on your one leg, it's your only point of contact, right? So that information about the characteristics of the surface that you're standing on, uh, if, you know, if there's any movement, that sort of stuff, it all comes back and like your brain has a map of your foot. And when you shift your pressure, it shifts, uh, like it, the sensors on your foot will detect where they shift. And then you'll have like a reaction, like your muscles will contract in a certain way to keep your balance. It, it's always constantly calculating where like your center, your mass is and, and your base of support. So it's always making these adjustments. So the idea with doing types of balance training that challenge that is to like make sure that the system, the map, everything is staying updated and that you're actually working those muscles in the very specific manner so that you keep the system. So there's there's like your capacities and with time and disuse, they, they'll decrease. And what I do with exercises is you just keep pushing them back. You keep pushing them back. Normal aging is going to bring it down. Like that's something that's inevitable and that's something that we all need to deal with. But the exercise has the potential to keep pushing that you know, and slowing it down to extending the quality of life. But that's basically what's going on. And in terms of like solutions, like a orthotic might actually impair the quality of the signals that you receive from your feet. So like you don't detect 
the surface as well, so it, it'll impair it, but it might also help. So it's a it's a it's a very you know a, a unique thing. And previously, I would have said that you know all these quantitative sort of analyses are necessary to determine that, but like your gut feeling is important too. Is like, do you feel more stable with it or not? And that's something that I think is a a, a check that you can do. Um, the other thing I'd say is that. It's not just the foot that gives information. That'll give you information about your contact, but there's receptors in your ankle, your muscles, your knee, your hip that are also providing information. The visual system is also providing information. So if you're doing an exercise like that and you kind of like safely want to challenge yourself, you can play with those sorts of things. Like you can, you know, close your eyes for like five seconds, make sure you've got something near that you can hold on to, to kind of like keep stimulating that sort of exercises. There's technology too that exists uh, that you can put in your your shoes, but that's kind of in a developmental phase. So, a great question. Love to talk about it more, but I think we got. Uh, uh, I hope it's useful for you to answer there, and uh, I think we got uh, to move to Danielle's presentation, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm, great. Con I'm conscious of time because I know people are all busy, right? So, but I yeah. appreciate the question. Thank you very much. Yeah, great question. Great answer. Uh, we can definitely discuss more after the last presentation. We've left some time at the end specifically for that. Um, so thank you, Grant. We'll move on to Danielle's presentation. See my slides? Uh, I see them in presenter view. So. This is a new version. Yeah, if you can press that presentation again, and then do um, you see the circle with the three dots at the bottom of your presentation? If you click that, you should be able to turn off presenter view. Oh. Uh, they're working now? Um. We can see them, yeah. They're just, it's just kind of like in the up in the corner, but we can still see the slides. I think for all intents and purposes. Oh, you're uh, in front of them now. <laughs> all right. Well, okay. we can do that. That works. That's fine. Oh. Let's let and that's better. No, that works. That was good, Daniel. Yeah, that was good. Whatever you had before. That was better. Uh, this is a new. Uh, New uh, like uh, version of this team. Anyways, so you see something? <laughs> yes. Yep. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I think it's uh, I have pressure now. Everybody's saying that I will talk about things, so I will try to talk about all of these things. My name is Danielle Bouchard. I'm located at UNB, and um, I work through the Cell Lab. Um, I was going to talk a bit about um, what is research. Uh, some uh, like Grant talked a bit about that, but I did ask my dad yesterday. Like when I say like um, research, what what does it tell you? And he says like, I don't know. Like I have no clue. Uh, in the sense that we do, and he's 60, 70 now. And uh, when we do research, I think we talk a lot about it, but we don't really know what that means. So I want. I want to touch base on this. Um, so what is research? And normally when we ask people what is research, what comes to mind is that you're in a white coat with some bubbles going on and some liquids of some sort, and then you're hyping things and I don't know. Uh, COVID-19 didn't help with that uh, idea of this is what our research is about. But the reality is that this is just one piece of research. And I actually like have access to a white uh, a wet lab that we call a white coat, but I don't really use it. Like that would be experimental uh, research where we collect samples of some sort and we're looking for different questions. But if you have like to um, say to somebody, what is research? I think what I'd like my kids to say anyway is um, you're answering questions. We have a ton of questions. You had some that you asked Grant and and, um, and Richard, and we as academics are like taking those questions and answering it. And so it could be anywhere, anywhere, and, and, and it could be anywhere, not only in the lab, but it could be like a survey, it could be an interview. We're gathering information. And what we're really after is we're trying to establish facts. And this is really important because we all know someone that it works for them. Like and a good example of that is that you all know somebody 
that eat that ate um, a cabbage soup and lost weight. And then you're eating cabbage soup and it doesn't work for you. And you're wondering like, why? Uh, we're after those uh, facts, like for majority of people, what works? And everybody will agree that it's never going to work for everybody the same way. But we're looking at like isolating one thing. And in my case, most of what I do is isolating exercise. When you do exercise, does it have an impact on falls risk? And obviously there's so many things that happens that makes you at risk of falls. And if you look at the tool that Richard uh, discussed, your medication, if you fell before, if you're afraid of falling, your physical activity level, and, 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 and the list goes on. So in research, what we're trying to do, we cannot combine all of these things together because it's complex. So we are looking at one thing at a time. So we are looking at people that do exercise and we talked about like balance, um, challenging your balance and other people that don't do that, but everything else being similar, uh, and then we have a better understanding of what's going on with that one thing and should it be recommended. Um, question that comes when we talk about research, and then I'll talk about the example of like Zoomers on the go, which we did research about, who funds research? You might wonder like who pays for those things? It costs a lot of money. It's your taxes most of the time. Uh, it's uh, managed by um, either federally or provincially or sometimes foundations. They are having committees and they're thinking about like what are the important questions that we need to ask? And then in the, when I send um, project that I want to do, it takes a year to write. Like it's a lot of a document to put together. And then there's questions that are more needed. Someone was asking about like, um, if I don't have a family doctor, that's a good question. I don't know what that is, but you could study this and figure out like, what are people doing? Uh, and what are the solutions? And so that th there's a lot of different questions, but we do submit application. And then really rarely we get money to do what we do. It's really competitive. Um, and then when people, um, sometimes people ask like, why am I getting paid to participate in a research study? Or am I going to get paid if I participate in a research study? And the answer is normally no, uh, because you get something out of it. So when we do research about exercise, people do get exercise most of the time for free, which is a benefit already, not in money, but still. And um, sometimes when you get, are paid for being participant in, in a research, it is because there's risk that we don't know. And if you have risk, then you're getting compensated to take the risk. Uh, but most of the time that would be for pharmaceutical companies um, and other companies that are looking after um, answering something. And in, uh, I would say like more like fun publicly funded uh, research, we often pay people to come for testing in the sense that the exercise, for example, is offered for free, but the exercise doesn't give me answers. It gives me what we call an exposure. It happens something, but we need to test to see the the, um, the benefits. So I will have like sometimes a small amount of money to incentivize, I'll get people to come back to us to see if it actually improve anything. So that's when it comes from money. Uh, who conduct research most of the time in Canada? It'll be academics, so people that have done a PhD, meaning that they have about, I want to say like 12 to 14 years of education, and they are normally employed as an academic in a research setting or in a university, and also a medical doctor can conduct research as other people as well, but most of the time that will be, and that's also like why they call us doctors. That's a good question that people ask. My grandma keeps saying that I'm a doctor. I'm kind of a doctor, but I say like a doctor that doesn't make a lot of money uh, compared to others. Uh, but uh, that it's because you are we are a doctorate in philosophy. That's what PhD means. And, and that's why like uh, it gets confusion. Anyways, side of that, um, who can be involved in research? Everybody. And you might wonder why are they looking for someone specific? You might have called somewhere and say, oh, I'm interested in the study. And they say, well, you're not included. And you wonder why. And the reason is on the left side, we're trying to isolate something. And to do so, we want to have like people that are in the group that are a bit similar because if they were all over the place, if we, we recruit people from age two to age 102, well, age will have a big impact on the results. So we try to control a bit 
uh, the the variability, like the, how much change or how much differences there is between people before they start the study. And that might be the reason why you would not be included. We could want to exclude people that have a certain medication because the medication has an impact on what we want to look at. So I'll stop here for this, the research piece of things and give you an example. So um, what I, there's different steps to the research pro project and what we hear most of the time in the news is the first step, which is create, creating evidence. And there's a lot of people creating evidence. Uh, and then once it is created, we want to replicate it, making sure that that's the thing. And then we want to share that or scale up. Uh, and then implement across. And that you can think about like COVID-19. We wanted to make sure the vaccine was good. We shared the data among us, uh, academics and uh, clinicians, and then we are scaling up and it still works. And then let's just implement. Um, 51 on the side um, is the number that the reduction that we know with the evidence that were created, how much you will reduce your risk of falls if you do exercise all year long, three hours a week and challenging your balance. And the reason, I mean, I'm happening to be in the field of exercise, but uh, it's the most single, uh, there's a lot of things you can do for false prevention. And we talked about this before today, but the, if you have to pick one, that's why we focus so much on exercise because you can draw by half your risk of falling if you do that. If you remove your rugs and if you uh, have your cataract removed and if you treat your medication, you can reduce even more. But one big thing is exercise, and that's why we focus on it. Uh, back in 2018, uh, I was involved in the program Zoomers on the Go to see if this program was reducing the risk of falls. There was a lot of interest at the time, but we didn't have a lot of evidence. So I was brought in to create evidence about this program. And if the evidence are not good, we kind of stop the process. But if they're good, then you can keep going in the ladder that I just showed you here, the triangle. So some of the evidence that we've shown is that when you do exercise with Zoomers on the go, so there was 84 people at the time that did the program and 26 that didn't do it. And the first two column is the, um, showing that the people that did the program went from 27 seconds uh, being able to stay on one leg without falling or stepping down uh, to 32 seconds. And so it's five seconds extra only by doing 12 weeks of the exercise program. And then the people who didn't do it uh, were, I mean, basically ch not changing. And that's the type of evidence that we hear in the news. A study showed. Yeah, a study showed this. And then this is only a small group of people. What if you replicate that with younger people, older people, whatever, right? Do you see the same thing? So to create the evidence can be a really long process. But at the end of the day, that's what we do. Uh, another example here, it's pretty busy. Science like to be complex uh, when we present stuff, but if you concentrate on the white bars and the black bars, you can observe pretty quickly that the white bars are higher than the black bars. And that's what, what it means is that uh, people seem to come, the white bars is online. So, and, and the people that are registered to the program online, because we offer Zoomers on the go online, they tend to come more often than those that are registered in person. And then we wonder why. And then never stops. Uh, the, the life of a researcher is never stopping because you're, uh, every time you create something or you find something, it raises more questions. When I was a kid, my parents thought I was going to be a journalist because I was always asking questions about things. But I guess I didn't fell really far from what they, that they thought, but didn't know <laughs> what research was about. But it's, it's why? And then the, the answer that could come to you would be, well, it's more accessible, right? Like on, uh, when it's... Uh, uh, there's snow outside or something like that, you might be more likely to show up to your computer versus going out, but why? So it creates more information and creates more questions. And once we have the data, we want to share. And how we do this as researcher is we publish papers. You might, you heard that again during COVID-19, this, this paper was published. And then you can see that it's our, like, again, I guess you cannot see, but like we, we published uh, the results of the Zoomers on the go in their European review of aging and physical activity. Why would someone from Belgium care about this? Because we're all the same. We're all having the same issues. It falls as an issue everywhere. And then we're sharing. And then um, these are um, uh, evaluated by peers. 
to make sure that what we do show up in some of those papers actually makes sense. And I put a, a, um, a little map of the world on the right side because we now also have to go share this information with other um, peers that are in conferences. And I mean, there's I don't think there's a continent I didn't go to share data about things that happen right here. So it shows how important it is and then how we can share information. So it's not only about New Brunswick and Edmonton and Moncton anymore. It's a lot bigger than that. To scale up, once we know it works, we want to scale up. And that's what we've done with Zoomers. So like you started in St. John, New Brunswick um, in 2009. There was 193 people doing the program. And then on the right side, we tested it in, in Fricta and see if it were actually re reducing the risk of falls. And the, on the bottom left, you see all the dots. Uh, this is where currently we have Zoomers on the go. So we are still having to go in the Northwest and um, Winston area that is uh, we're getting to. But the purple uh, dots show that we have participants and leaders. Uh, the green is where we train leaders. So we'll have more participants this, this at that, these spots. And then the black are uh, people that are online, regardless if it's offered in their community. And we got more funding to go across Canada, and that's what we're doing right now. We're offering across Canada online. And just to give you a sense of numbers, uh, in the fall 2023, we had 1,500 uh, people, 1,550 doing the program, and uh, a third of that was online. So every time we offer, which is every 12 weeks, uh, we offer all year long, but it's a, it's done every 12 weeks. We are doubling what we had. Like it, it just like the growth of this program is just amazing. But um, the resources need to follow to make sure that we are able to support it in the right way. So now that we scale up, uh, the next step is implementation. And implementation is about not about the person anymore. It's not about do you fall or not. We know that. We know when you do Zoomers on the go, you can reduce uh, your risk of falls. Now it's a question of like why organizations or municipalities or um, foundation do not promote uh, such a program. And then you see on the right side, attract, adapt, implement, and sustain. If you look at who shows up to those fall prevention exercise program, it's mostly white women Caucasian. And if I look at the the uh, like auditorium or today like online, I'm pretty sure even though you don't have your camera that it will be mostly that. So why is this interest for women uh, to have some information and undo something about it, like taking action to reduce risk of falls that we don't see in male? And that's one thing. But we also have issues with attracting um, uh, minorities that don't seem to be bothered with this. Uh, so we're looking into like why uh, we have a lot of program that exists across Canada. There's actually like 400 and something program that do say that they reduce the risk of falls. But when you look at their content, they don't do what um, their recommendations are. So offering all year long, three hours a week and challenge balance. So we have we're working with those organizations to understand why and how we can help to actually improve what they offer. Implement is about showing um, up with Zoomers on the go across Canada and um, giving that package to other organizations that are in need. And the last piece is sustain, trying to understand why some of those programs that people love but disappear because of no no one no reason to be found. Like at some point you want to register and they're they're gone. Why? And then why are, are there programs that been around forever and still around? So that's what we're after right now. And um, you can find more information about the Zoomers on the Go program, either to be um, a leader uh, or a participant. I should have said that, but it's a it's a program that is led by leaders and it, they're all volunteers. Um, so if you're interested, you can go show, uh, show up on Facebook and find the information. You can al always email us and obviously email me directly if you want to. So I'll stop here. And this is like all the funders. Again, like if you look at all of these, you can see that this is all tax related money uh, that fund all of those programs to understand if it's the right way to put money into and continue these type of programs such as Zoomers on the go. So I'll stop here and I'll take some questions. Great, thank you very much, Danielle. Do we have any questions from anybody in the audience? Sorry, it's me again. That's I'm... totally okay, ask your questions. <laughs> we love people uh, who ask questions. I always like to get in first because so that I don't, the nerves don't hit me that I'm talking in public. <laughs> 
Uh, I am a new <clears throat> member of Zoomers on the Go, and uh, I am in BC. Mm. So I I'm I belong to a little group, a little Zoom group that I met at another program, and they are now interested in it as well. So I've uh, given them the information about Zoomers on the Go. And the reason that they're interested, part of it is, is because I told them that I really enjoyed the instructor of my class. I did have I did join a, a UBC um, program two or three years ago that was for improving balance, but I found it extremely boring. Um, so for me, sorry, I'm being honest. I I really enjoy variety. And so one of the things that's so great is that there are so many choices. Unfortunately, you're four hours ahead of us. So yes. the 6 a.m. class just doesn't work. Uh, but it gives me a chance, like say I have a meeting or have something else on the go where like recently I hurt my foot, so I had to give it up for a bit. So it's like, it gives me a, a choice and some variety. I really like the feedback. I like to know what, what muscles I'm working. And I like the variety of every week, every, sorry, every class is different. It's not all the, the same exercises and over and over. I mean, you see them repeating, but I like that. All right. Um, so I think one of the things you were going to be researching was like why people stop. And I think part of it is the boredom. Um, I just, I find that I used to be a, a couch potato, I'll have to admit. All right. So it's, it's difficult that I'm even doing things. I used to be very obese as well. So I'm used to just sitting on the couch and I can read a book. I can sit in front of the computer for hours. So it's getting that motivation all right, to actually do something. Um, so I'm capable of doing the exercises. I also like being part of the AIMS research program, and I certainly like the bonus points that we get. So we get gift cards for participating. <laughs> so like, say, getting a birthday present for free, right? So that's nice. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I'd be curious about the findings of your research uh, about why people leave, because I read an article just recently that, They've uh, re somebody is researching how well people's balance or, or number of falls. I think it's the number of falls while doing the program, and then they stop. And apparently, the benefits don't continue forward after you stop doing the exercise program. So I think it's the really worthwhile to uh, also indicate that that you need to continue doing the program. This is something recently I just saw on the on the online news. So I don't know if you're aware of the all the details of the research. I just remember that that summary. So I thought that was quite interesting as well. So anyway, I appreciate I appreciate your comment. I really enjoy the program. So I'm just trying to spread the word. This is a really good program for you know getting off the couch and doing something so thank you well i think you didn't have it all, all uh, in questions in there but like uh thanks for your comments about um zoomers on the go it's a good point that like one of the, the feature that we see is that when you go online it gives you a lot of flexibility and normally you can all like you're registering a program and it's happening monday and wednesday and if you don't show up or if you have a doctor's appointment or if you have something that you can't get to then you have to skip that week versus in our case it's a free program you don't have to like show up every class and then you can pick and choose bidding on your week and i think that's uh, a feature that uh, we like to keep um in the online um offer so i do, I do have a question just to give you one um, <laughs> thanks uh, I know you're taking statistics that sort of uh, recording the, the attendance. Yeah. Are you recording the attendance of the people who, that are looking at the taped uh, classes? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Um, because we're now in the implementation phase in a sense that we know that if you do Zoomers, you'll have the benefits. We're mm -hmm. not really as much intrigued at this point about the person, but more so about the people. So when we take attendance, we take attendance of like, we don't look at if um, uh, Karen is there today. We're looking at how many people come in the program. So like the same way as we have for pre-recorded uh, classes, we do have uh, the number of people that came and, and used the link, but we don't know who they were. And we're not that uh, much interested. And you were talking about like people that leave. We're also like more interested in knowing why organizations stop offering because you can want to come back, but if it's not offered, you can't um so uh that as well but yes we keep track of well researchers are a bit like um little rats of numbers so we keep track of a lot of things that we will never use <laughs> so we keep track of everything that you can think about uh, in terms of numbers 
The reason I asked was that I know they recommend three times a week versus two times a week. And yep. so you basically, if you can't get to the classes, like for us in BC, it's harder to get three classes in with your schedule. Yep. We have to go to the tape. So I was just curious if you're tracking that information. Yeah, we do. And we uh, after like, a, I think it's week 10, we send like a survey for people to re or to report how many times per week they often go. And then we're uh, I did put in the chat um, the videos uh, move 50 plus is a, a website in um, in Quebec and they are developing right now uh, 12 weeks worth of uh, uh, videos for us uh in um in french and english uh and it will be posted on their website and this we can also track people that will use it but also if you look at the quality of their videos versus our like bottom of the basement someone doing this when they could uh it will be a lot more attractive for you as well to use the pre-recorded videos and that's funding that gives us access to uh to these materials all right. Well, keep do it. Keep playing. You know, supplying music because for me that's a huge motivation. Good. You can also use your own music in the back and put yourself on mute, and you could oh. go for wild. <laughs> yes. I'd have to develop that first, though. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? I will ask our um, exercise specialists, Danielle and Grant, to talk a little bit more about exercises that challenge balance. I think one of the things with recommending exercise for people is we all know that we have to do it, but it's hard to find the right resources on what kind of exercises to do and what you really mean by exercises that challenge balance. Is it more than just a single leg stance that you can do? I sure hope so, because it would be boring and Elena, I believe, would leave. Uh, the program if uh, one leg sense would be the only thing that we do so um, a lot of ways that you can challenge your balance and uh, one way that is easy in a safe manner is by closing your eyes as soon as you close your eyes uh, a side of a wall a side of a, like a, a chair obviously because you want to have support uh, you will be challenged a bit and if that is easy then you can remove a bit of what Grant said like your uh, base of support uh, and that's why we always refer to like one leg stands, because if you go on one leg, you're removing, you're reducing your base of support. Um, if you change your position in your um, in your surrounding, you will have um, to challenge your balance. Uh, for example, whenever you go uh, and do the stairs, you're challenging your balance. If you close your eyes while you're like climbing the stairs, you're challenging your balance because you're moving. You have to adapt all the time. And then on the top of that, you don't have your visual uh, re like a, uh, like a safe net to go to. You can uh, do this. Um, a, a good uh, exercise that you can do home for challenging your balance is to try to pick up a penny. Well, they don't exist anymore, but like a um, 25 cents uh, that you put on the uh, on something that is lower and go and pick it up. You will have to challenge your balance because you're now not only on one Foot, and if you are on two feet, that works, but um, it will challenge your balance. So you don't have to go like crazy and have the equipment of the or a state of the art, but changing the, the normal position of your standing, no matter how you do it, will challenge your balance. And the more you're at risk, the more you don't have to do a lot to actually feel that you're going to um, lose balance or have to recover to not lose your balance. And it's not a question of like, uh, being this doing this like in a in a way that you can harm yourself it doesn't have like to be like you're all like going crazy uh, but uh, any time you are removing your two feet from the floor you are um, challenging your balance we have a hand up Dolores you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question Hello, Daniel. Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, a few questions concerning what you just uh, mentioned about the uh, challenging balance exercises. Uh, I just recently completed my uh, my course as a leader for Zoomers on the Go in September, and uh, we were told that the eyes must remain open all the time, and we were also uh, told that you cannot put your head uh, too far down below the heart so that 
it prevents uh, being uh, unsteady or uh, yeah. it'll dizzy. Yeah, it's dizzy. Uh, uh, can, can we can we challenge our participants and have them close their eyes for a minute or two, holding on to a chair or holding on to a wall? Uh, well, the question is like this is like FNB offering the certification and also like holding the um, the uh, liability, right? So okay, when the yeah. FNB does uh, prevent um, collateral problems, like so they when people are volunteering and Zoomers on the go, they have a different background. Like some people are like done this all their life, they're past nurse, whatnot, and others never done any exercise program uh, in their community or themselves. So they're really, really careful to start off with. What we are developing right now with Fitness New Brunswick is level two of Zoomers on the go. Once you've done it like a year or so, you now like know how to encourage people, how to modify if there's anything, and then we can add to it. And that's what we're looking into right now. Okay, with, that's uh, great. Program. Yeah. Okay, so you you do not encourage the closing the eyes and I, reaching out to the. There's Is a that difference, uh, Dolores. Like there's a difference between what I encourage and what FNB agrees to take okay. the risk for, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And and that's where like uh, it has like this is. Related to rely like liability uh, yeah. insurance. Right? Okay, I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, Grant, go ahead. I just want to add, it's a great question. Uh, you know, like the liability sometimes prevents people from doing the types of things that might be a benefit to them in certain contexts. But uh, to go back to the question about the types of exercises. Uh, one thing that kind of surprised me, because uh, I think a lot of people are based in the latest, uh, you know, um, decisions around what to include as exercise in the programs on a specific article that came out in 2017, 2018, Catherine Sibley's uh, work, right, on a network meta analysis. But one of the things that was in there that surprised me was flexibility, right? That that's one of the five components that's important mm -hmm. for preventing uh, falls, right? For reducing falls risk. So there's these balance ex exercises, but also ensuring that you can move through, you know, a normal or a, a good uh, range of motion for each of your different joints. So like proper shoulder, hip, knee, ankle mobility is important for uh, promoting balance. And I think sometimes that kind of gets forgotten uh, as as one of the things. And the other thing about like the the standing on one leg, I'd say, yeah, standing on one leg is good. Uh, pick up a penny if you can or like trace a figure eight with your other leg. There's a whole bunch of different stuff you can you can do. But the idea is to be in a dynamic situation. So it's like shifting your weight or doing something that's going to shift your weight that forces you to respond to it. Um, one of the things that we've done in a program here is. Um, juggling so like or just like throwing like a bean bag up in the air or as in a group activity we throw a ball back and forth and people have to like you know share something about themselves so it's it's about putting yourself in challenging situations and not just being static so not just staying still but working on your balance while you're moving i think is is the goal that and flexibility awesome those are all great examples of exercises. Dolores, did you have another question? No, that's all. Thank you. Awesome. Do we have any other questions before we wrap up Cafe Scientific? All right. It looks like that's it. But uh, if you do have any questions, uh, you can always send us a message on our CELAB Facebook page. Um, uh, or reach out to one of our uh, experts. They had their uh, contact information up on the presentations. Um, but thank you for all for attending today. And if you want to join either of the uh, balance programs, uh, the, the links were in the chat there. And I can also send them out as resources afterwards with the survey. So thank you very much.